the last 50 years, the annual mean temperature has increased by five degrees. Even with the Paris Agreement, we are moving in that direction. It was like I was living in a, you know, a snow globe, uh, and inside the snow globe is climate change. Probably the center point of the path of the tornado. I'm meteorologist and journalist Jacqueline Whittall. I have covered the world's most extreme weather over the past decade and have witnessed firsthand how climate change is impacting our weather patterns. When I was invited to join an expedition in Svalbard, Norway, the epicenter of climate change, I jumped at the opportunity. Svalbard is located at around 78 degrees north latitude and is a collection of islands off the coast of mainland Norway. I was invited to join on board the MS Nordstrom with female citizen scientists Suniva Sorbi and Hilda Fallum-Strom. These women spent over 19 months alone in a cabin on Svalbard, documenting and collecting scientific data on behalf of NASA, Polar Bears International, and many other organizations from around the world. I was honored to spend time with them and over 60 other like-minded scientists, activists, artists, and many others. As we set out to view the glaciers with our own eyes, we would learn and discuss solutions about climate change. Our first stop was the town of Longyearbyen. The charming town of Longyearbyen sits at 78 degrees north latitude and is not only the world's farthest north permanent settlement, it's also the world's fastest warming location on Earth due to climate change. It's home to the World Seed Vault, 2,500 residents and many polar bears. The town is always on guard for dangerous and curious visitors like bears, but residents are even more dialed in to the local weather patterns. They are seeing many changes in just a short amount of time. For hundreds of years in Svalbard, coal production was the main industry. You can see the evidence of this on many mountaintops. Today, tourism and research have taken over, but you don't have to look far to be reminded of who was here first. It's a bit of a myth that there are more polar bears here on Svalbard than people, but it's not the case. It is, however, suspected that there are nearly 3,000 polar bears that live on the island in total. And sometimes they actually come into town in Longyearbyen. They have a warning system, much like we have in Canada, where if we get a tornado warning, it comes to our phone. Locals get a notice on their phone if a polar bear has been seen in town. Polar bears are a real danger here to locals. And every time I walked to town myself, I would see many people carrying a rifle as a just in case. Surprisingly, here in Longyearbyen, we're actually warmer than many Canadian locations that are further south. The reason for that is the ocean current that moves west of Svalbard and really all the way through Scandinavia as well. The North Atlantic Current is a powerful warm current within the Atlantic Ocean that extends the Gulf Stream northeastward. It transports more warm tropical water to northern latitudes than any other boundary current. Average summer temperatures on Svalbard range between 3 and 7 degrees Celsius in July, and winter temperatures anywhere from about minus 13 to minus 20 degrees Celsius in January. While the summer temperatures stay rather constant and cool, the winter temperatures are relatively mild. This warm ocean current, in essence, is responsible for warming Svalbard at four times the rate compared to other Arctic locations. The warming of the earth due to increasing excess greenhouse gases is all being absorbed by our oceans and disaster struck this town as a result. After Christmas, we have an avalanche in the mountain behind me. And uh, that avalanche was so big that it destroyed 14 houses and also killed two people. A little girl two years old and a man 32, 33 years old. Here on the morning of December 19, 2015, a fatal avalanche buried parts of the town. It destroyed 11 houses and trapped more than 20 people inside demolished buildings. Nine of the trapped people were buried in snow for up to two hours before being rescued. And in 2017, we got a new avalanche who took the, took the house and the six flats in the house where I grew up in the 70s. As a result of increased snowpack in the winter and melting in the warmer spring season, the risk of avalanches is high. 
the warming uh, climate, we are starting to see the snow become more unstable in the wintertime on some of these slopes. So they built a lot of these avalanche barriers to try and keep the snow away from the populated area uh, in Longyearbyen. When I grew up, we had a problem with, with avalanche on that mountain. But I think the, the weather change, the climate change, wind direction change, that's why we have the avalanche. Magnus is right. Historically, it's not the norm. A combination of factors led to the unusual avalanche, unstable snow, but in addition to that, winds were also a factor. A combination of uh, heavy uh, precipitation and uh, uh, quite unusual wind direction, uh, which made the snow pile a different way than it used to. And that is certainly what we also see in the climate projections, that we will have more heavy precipitation and uh, the snow will be, um, yeah, have a higher water uh, content. For a town that in many ways is frozen in time, the pace they'll need to move to keep ahead of climate change's warming trend leaves the future here incredibly uncertain. Just about to start our journey on our ship and we'll be uh, traveling through many fjords, seeing glaciers, hopefully some polar bears, uh, reindeer. It was now time to start sailing through the fjords on Svalbard. We would sail through the night and start our day the next morning by viewing the glaciers and many beautiful sights. Embarking on a mission at sea on the MS Nordstjernen. Nordstjernen is Norwegian for the North Star. The vessel was constructed in Germany in 1956 and is now run by Hurtigruten Svalbard. So it is just after 11 p.m. and uh, it's still light outside and the boat's getting kind of uh, rocky. Um, I have taken some uh, anti-nausea medication so I don't get seasick. I'll just show you kind of what's going on out my little window here in my cabin. There's the Arctic Ocean. You can hear the sounds too. And you can see the waves. Winds are supposed to be picking up um, into the night. We're going to sail all night, but all night it's still pretty light outside because it doesn't actually get fully dark. Day one on the ship, uh, everybody had a pretty restless sleep because it was really rocking and rolling in terms of the waves. Uh, very mild here in Svalbard. Um, you can see the ocean is quite calm at the moment. We have a foggy day, which is not really typical. There's an area of low pressure that's nearby. Uh, that's why we had some strong winds and some very large waves last night. But things have calmed down, but we are expected to get some rain today. It had an eerie feeling, the rain and the warmth this far north. That day we watched several glaciers from the ship and some were calving. Calving is when chunks of ice break off at the terminus or the end of a glacier. Ice breaks off because of the forward motion. That is absolutely astonishing. It is unbelievable. It's going to get bigger. There. all shocked to see the glaciers changing right before our eyes. If I'm feeling like this, how does resident and glaciologist Hedda Anderson feel about these changes, these glaciers that line the archipelago known as Svalbard and their future? I woke up one day to do a trail that I do every week, basically, because I have two huskies and they need to be walked. It's a nice trail up to a mountain uh, along a glacier. And I was walking the trail and I came there and I stopped and the trail was gone. It had fallen up because this trail was on top of an ice cord moraine, uh, which is glacial debris that's on top of the previous snout of a glacier that has retreated. Uh, and once these start melting out, these whole terrains, they just co collapse completely. As a glaciologist, Hedda is passionate about the area she calls home and spends most of her free time documenting the retreat of the glaciers from the sky. So I 
work a lot with imagery. Uh, I am a drone pilot, I have much of my degrees based on what is called remote sensing. Um, and since I can't afford a satellite, I use my drone a lot. With a drone you can do scientific research uh, by using imagery, uh, which is very visual. Hedda is also co-founder of the project known as Living Ice, where you can log on to a website yourself any time of day to see a 360 degree view of multiple glaciers in Svalbard and see how they are changing right before your eyes. For me, uh, one of the things that also has made a really big impression on me recently is the winter we've had on Svalbard this year. Uh, since I came here in 2018, you know, at the university, uh, you know, the professors, they teach us that climate change is very real here. It's happening very fast, We're turning into a more wet and warm climate, uh, moving away from a polar desert climate. We're going to see more snow, more rain, more precipitation, higher air temperatures. And yeah, we've been seeing that. And we've had days where we've gone from minus 43 degrees Celsius in one day to four plus in the next day. And it's pouring rain. This warming that Hedda is referring to is directly linked to ocean heat. The warmer our air temperatures on Earth, the warmer our oceans. And then we're basically sending a conveyor belt of heat directly towards this part of the Arctic. Hedda breaks down the North Atlantic Current, short form known as NAC. A deep sea current uh, that as it travels northward, it has quite salty water um, that it can travel along the surface but also be uh, heavier so it's kind of split in a surface current and a heavier more dense uh, deep sea current. It travels from southern latitudes in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it goes along the Norwegian coast and for us growing up in Norway we have always like bless the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic current because without it we wouldn't have summers. <laughs> So Which, it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, you know, it was a very positive thing, like growing up. That's what we were taught. Um, however, now that our oceans are warming at the rate they are, and the North Atlantic is warming at the rate it is. So when you have a warm current coming in, the cold water coming down from the North Pole can no longer actually counterbalance. And because of this, the Barents Sea off the coast of Svalbard is expected to be completely ice-free by 2050. To make matters worse, the water is moving up and over the continental shelf. Uh, and when it comes over the continental shelf, that Atlantic water comes into the fjords and really increases the temperature in the fjords, which really makes it difficult for sea ice to form as it used to. Uh, and this process in the Arctic is known as Atlantification. There is some scientific debate as to whether or not the NAC could weaken as a result of cooler fresh water from glacial melt mixing with it. That's not physically possible uh, because when glacial uh, melt water flows into the fjords, you have to think that uh, these are packets of cold fresh water and what happens locally in the fjords is that this cold water usually stays here on top. Of, uh, the, in the top layer of the fjords and then you have warmer, more dense and salty water below. So you get this stratification in, in the ocean. And this uh, freshwater layer um, does not allow carbon exchange that normally happens with the atmosphere from the sea, which actually creates a lid uh, in the fjords that can lead to, for instance, anoxic conditions, which really, really affects uh, whatever lives below the sea and uh, all creatures. Speaking to Hedda was certainly an eye-opener. I can only imagine those creatures in the sea are not the only ones impacted. What about what feeds on top of the shrinking ice? There's a polar bear over there on that grassy mountain. It's really hard to see, but you gotta trust me that it is there. But what's interesting is he's just lying in the grass and uh, he looks like he's very full, which is great to see. Polar bears were forced off of the ice, off of the sea ice, uh, you know, in, early in the summer, and here they are, there's still no ice, and it's going to be a while looking at this and looking at the weather patterns before they have ice to uh, get back out on. The polar bears here, like the polar bears everywhere, are dependent on the sea ice for catching their food, and they're doing without sea ice for an ever longer period because of global warming. And the warming rate here is faster, 
the sea ice decline has been faster, and so this is one of the most vulnerable of the populations uh, in the world. So a couple of decades ago, there'd probably be lots of ice out here, and bears would be able to be out on it. The Barents Sea uh, is one of the most productive seas in the Arctic. Uh, bears may be able to do very well when that water is covered with ice, but when it's not, they can't catch the seals when they're swimming around in the open ocean. Uh, so that's a negative effect. Polar bears have kind of divided themselves into two sort of ecological strategies. Uh, there are bears that follow the sea ice to the north and stay on the ice and hunt throughout the summer. And then there are bears that hang out in these fjord systems and near shore and they manage to make a living uh, by hunting at the glacial fronts and then to some extent supplementing it with hunting for birds eggs and and maybe uh, the occasional uh, Svalbard reindeer that sort of thing. Florian Ledoux, photographer and resident of Arctic Norway, has been documenting the bears for a decade. Not only has he seen changes in the weather and the sea ice conditions, but also what the bears are hunting, what they're eating. What we see so far is that the bears in Svalbard are mostly doing doing great. Yeah, they would just you know kill a reindeer, eat, sleep, move a kilometer on the shoreline or on the mountain slope. And just about, you know above the above the sea, and uh, just you know walk there and take a reindeer the day after. He was hunting uh, one reindeer per day. Yeah, even three a day sometimes. That very day, we saw a polar bear on the side of a mountain, just like Florian described. There were three or four reindeer that could be seen nearby, and the polar bear seemed rather sluggish, tired, almost as if he had a full belly. I wonder if he's waiting for those. And they are further up too. Right I here. see some. You look a little bit further up. I see. Yeah. yeah. Most of the bears that we see doing that are young. They are fit. Um, they run for long, much longer than you know the big male fat and uh, that will just hunt um, seals. The bears that we saw specializing in hunting reindeer, they would take a reindeer a day. There is definitely a, a, a bit of a learning curve. There, where the, the bears learn from, you know, from from the mother. Basically, some of the bears and some of the cubs that are also, you know, thriving, uh, just living on reindeer. And I guess it's a bit too soon to know, you know, the the impact on how they they might change the diet or the effect that it might have on on them as well. I think they are very smart. They they will do whatever it takes for them to survive. For me, it's a sign of hope. While it does seem plausible that polar bears could have a good dietary alternative if all the ice was one day gone, it's not the permanent fix, says Dr. Steve Amstra. The bears that are on shore are hungry. And like, like any kind of bear, a black bear or a grizzly bear, they will eat anything they can. And these bears can't catch the seals uh, that they would normally be feeding on on the sea ice. They come ashore, what are they gonna do? Some of them have figured out how to hunt reindeer, and uh, the reindeer can supplement and maybe prolong the period of time that, they're, that they can stay on land and still survive, uh, but it's not a total answer. This is because the fat content of a seal is far greater than that of a reindeer, a much leaner animal. The bears require this fat in their diet. It's not just about polar bears. Uh, the cold in the Arctic, the Arctic ice pack, is a great moderator for the climate over the rest of the world. So I, what I like to say is, if we are successful at stopping warming in time to save polar bears, we'll benefit the rest of life on Earth, including us. I have been uh, working quite a bit with the future scenarios for, for Svalbard. I didn't believe the numbers I got. The kind of increase we are talking about now, oh, one degree per decade, which would mean 10 degrees in 100 years. And I didn't believe it. And no, I see that actually that is the direction we are moving in now.
Those numbers are difficult to even imagine what kind of impact they would have locally here in Svalbard, but also around the entire world. You see, as sea ice melts on Earth, it's unlikely it will be back for an extremely long time. The impact of melting ice on sea levels on Svalbard and around the world could mean more devastating hurricanes and typhoons, with storm surge being the biggest threat. It's for all of these important reasons and examples of climate change that local resident Hilda Fallum Strong and Norwegian Canadian Suniva Sorby embarked on an extremely challenging citizen science expedition. This was all in the name of climate change. Initially, it was a nine month uh, stay, and then when COVID came in, it turned into 19 months. I think we're an example of, you know, we are citizen scientists. We are two extraordinary, ordinary people. But I think the, the power of um, being in this remote location for such an extended period of time, we can be of great value to scientists and researchers, and we were. In 2019, they overwintered alone for 19 months. I travel back to where they stayed on Svalbard and hear their incredible stories. Individuals, every single one of us, are able to turn this around. Don't stop believing that you really have uh, an impact that you can make through your voice or through your personal actions.